John chapter 13, beginning in verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you shall follow me afterward. Verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Chapter 14, verse 1, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Let's pray together. Lord, we are so thankful that you revealed through the Apostle John by your Spirit this time of of you preparing your disciples for your departure. Lord, we want to learn everything But more than just learning information, Lord, we really want to engage you and have you speak to us. We open up our hearts to you. We ask that your Holy Spirit would comfort us, redirect us, convict us, all the things that he does so well. We want to be doers of your word, not hearers only. So we yield our hearts and our lives to you right now. Speak to us, Lord, your servants are listening. We pray that you'd set aside this time for your holy use, and we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are back in the upper room, and it's the night of Jesus' betrayal and arrest. And Jesus is in the middle of preparing his disciples for his departure. He cares about them so much. Here, they were focused mainly on themselves, fighting over who's the greatest. And here Jesus is preparing them for his departure, and he cares so much about their hearts, as we're going to see this morning, but more so, he's, he's concerned about their faith and them maintaining their faith throughout this entire night and beyond. By the end of this night, every single one of those disciples will have scattered. Jesus has already told them that. He's already told them that that fulfills prophecy, actually. And so he's been preparing them for his departure. We saw last time, a couple weeks ago, that he the first thing that he gets into after he purges Judas from the room, the first thing he gets to is loving one another, the command to love one another. And we wouldn't need commanding if sometimes we weren't so unlovable. And he calls us to love one another based on him, not if people are so lovable or deserve it, just like we don't receive love from God because we deserve it. But we're called to love them because God is love. God, it blesses God's heart. It's it's what God's called us to do in terms of being appropriate towards his sons and daughters. And it blesses him when we care for one another. And he said it affects unbelievers' lives. Because he said, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. And we're going to (laughs) need... And one another's love as we go through difficulty. And the disciples are going to go through extreme difficulty. And they're going to be extremely vulnerable. And we know when we're vulnerable, we're not always at our best. And as they say, you find out what's in the cup when it gets bumped, right? So we go through difficulty. We're at our worst at times. And we get to see one another as we have that intimacy and that relationship with one another. We get to see what comes out of the cup, so to speak. And it's not always pretty. I can speak for myself, for sure, and I think you can too. Later, Jesus is going to tell Peter, as we're told in Luke 22, verses 31 through 32, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that, that he may sift you as wheat. When they sift wheat, they're separating the wheat from the chaff. It's agitation. It's difficulty. It's, it's something that would cause Peter great turmoil. But verse 32, we're told in Luke 22, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Again, his priority is their faith, not their emotions, not anything else supremely. It's about their faith. He cares about our faith. So he says, and when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. And he does that. We'll see that in in John. He will strengthen his brethren. So their faith is going to be extremely tested, but even before that, their hearts are going to be extremely troubled. Jesus knows their hearts. 
He's, his spirit's been troubled multiple times. We've seen in the last four, four chapters, multiple times it says his spirit was troubled. Now it's time for his disciples. They're going to receive that troubled uh, condition. And so he gives a solution to it. That's why my message is entitled to this morning, Jesus' Solution for the Troubled Heart. Maybe your heart's troubled this morning. Maybe you've heard some bad news. Maybe you've, you're dealing with a specific situation and God would say to you this morning that he, he has solution for that. He cares about our hearts and what we go through. He's sensitive to those things. He suffered. He's a faithful high priest that can sympathize with us in our weaknesses. So today we're going to see Jesus reveal our responsibility in managing our own hearts. We're going to see our responsibility to place our faith in Jesus. Because if we have options, we can place our faith in other things. The only thing that's worthy of our faith is, is Jesus. Your faith is only as good as the object in whom it is placed. So we are always on the wisdom side of things when we put our faith in Jesus. And, and so he wants us to know that. And then also we're going to see the abundance of mansions in heaven and how he's gone to prepare a place for us. That helps our troubled hearts. And lastly, that we'll be with Jesus for all eternity. That helps our troubled hearts as well. Having an eternal perspective. We, we are looking up, we're seeing his perspective, he's pouring into us at times, but then when we get our eyes focused on the horizontal, and we start to see the cares of this world, and we start to see those things that are coming against us, things related to the fall of man, things related to people meaning things that are evil for us, our hearts can be troubled. And he tells us it's under our purview to have our hearts be uh, mitigated or the... the, the uh, the struggle within our hearts be mitigated by listening to what he says for us. Now notice what Peter asked Jesus, uh, what he asked him there whether, regarding where he's going in verse 36. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where, where, you are, where I am going, you cannot follow me now. Notice the word now. But you shall follow me afterward. What Peter really wants to know is where are you going and why can't we follow you? Why, why, where are you going? That, where could you possibly be going that we can't follow? Can't understand it. It's like a toddler. You know, I, I feel for you moms out there where you're home with the new toddler and the terrible twos. And the one goal that you should have related to terrible twos is they don't get what they want. Everything else can be negotiable. But if you're in your terrible twos, you're not allowed to get what you want. And that's all you want when you're two is what you want. And they don't have any peace and quiet. And they're wanting to follow you in the bathroom. And you know, and then they're, you finally let them into the bathroom. And then they're asking you, what are you doing in there? And you know, like, what's, I have to explain myself now. Isn't it semi-obvious here what I'm doing? But they just want to know, why can't I go where you go? I should be, I'm entitled. The universe revolves around me as a toddler. And I should be able to go wherever you go, mom. But Peter's He's stuck on this. I believe he's been stuck on this since verse 33 where, where we saw this. Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. I think once Peter heard that, he was lost. His mind was gone. And then Jesus is talking about loving one another, all these things. And I bet you it was so hard for him to focus and concentrate because Peter would, didn't even think it was possible that Jesus could go somewhere that they wouldn't be allowed to come. They've had so much access up to this point. They could go wherever he went for the most part, except when he was going away quietly in solitude to pray, they were not allowed to follow him there. And when Jesus, when he said in verse 36, where I'm going, you cannot follow me now, but, but you shall follow me afterward, Jesus was telling the truth. That path, that cup that was designated to him, he had to die for the sins of the world alone. He couldn't have somebody with him. It was a path that only he was on. It was a one-person path. And, he, he, and he, it, wasn't, it wasn't even possible. And, and so this is all part of the punishment that we deserved, where the, the solitude and this loneliness of the cross and everything that he suffered was necessary because Jesus didn't go through anything. He didn't suffer anything that wasn't absolute necessary regarding what he had to pay for our redemption. The father even turned his face away 
David wrote about this a thousand years before the birth of Christ in Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Giving us insight into the cross that we would never even have in the Gospels about what was going on in his heart. And Jesus cried out, why, why have you forsaken me? Everybody's forsaken me, but you? There was something that happened there regarding fellowship, or we don't, we don't know. But there was something that within the Godhead that happened when the sins of the world were laid upon Jesus. And God cannot look upon sin. But that was so important to the Lord Jesus. But that was part of the suffering, part of the cup that was dealt him, part of what was required to die for us. Peter would follow him afterward. Because he says at the end of verse 36, but you shall follow me afterward. He would follow him. 32 years later, Peter would be crucified upside down because he said he wasn't worthy to die like in the same way of his Lord. He was crucified. And the Apostle John records Jesus speaking about this, and we'll get to it later in the gospel, but I want to read to you from chapter 21, verses 18 and 19. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Now this, this was in one way giving information that Peter couldn't know otherwise, that he was going to be old. He was going to grow to be old. He wasn't going to die before he was old. But then he was going to, they were going to stretch out his hands and they would nail his hands to a cross too. And he would die a martyr's death. And, and so when that happened, he glorified God in that way. And he said, that's why he said, follow me. Now, Peter's response in verse 37, Peter said to him, Lord, why can I not follow you now? I will lay down my life for your sake. Now, I'm sure Peter had the greatest of intentions. And he was speaking honestly, I believe, from his heart, what he believed, what would happen. Um, but he was trusting in reality in his own resources to do what he said he would do. And we don't have those resources in ourselves. And also, he would would be, after this, on the day of Pentecost, he would be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive power to be a witness to Jesus. As Jesus said, that was the purpose of why he would do that to them, and he would come upon them to be a witness to him. And they would, from that point on, you see total boldness. After the resurrection, especially, because it doesn't make any sense that they would have any confidence that God could raise them from the dead and give them a body if he couldn't do it to, with Jesus. And so thus they wouldn't have given their lives over and be, be martyred as a result. So that's strong evidence of the veracity of God's word in the resurrection. But Jesus answers in verse 38, Jesus answered him, will you lay down your life for my sake? Most assuredly, I say to you, the rooster shall not crow till you have denied me three times. Now again, Peter wouldn't even imagine that he would even deny the Lord once. But three times before the morning, that very night, he's going to deny the Lord. What is going to happen? But yet he has this self-confidence that that's never going to happen. But Jesus said, this will happen. And it was true. It, It did happen. And I think it's remarkable that Jesus reveals Peter's failures before Peter even knows them. That's incredible. The Lord knows us better than we know ourselves. Do you you agree with that? He knows us better than we know ourselves. And we all have hidden weaknesses and failures that are yet to be revealed. And we hate when we fall short. We hate when we sin and, and we sin against him. We hate all that. But he knows our failures better than we do. He knew about those failures from eternity past. He knew them. He knew all about our failures at the cross and still died for all those. I always say this often because it blows my mind. He died for sins of you and I that we haven't even committed yet. That's how well he knows us. That's how well he knows our failures. So we're not, we, we can't think that, well, he doesn't know what's gonna, what I'm going to do. He knows what, we, what we're going to do. He doesn't cause us to do those things, but he knows. And which brings me to my first point. We can trust Jesus with our present and future failures. Sometimes we struggle with our current failures, but even the ones we haven't even happened yet, he knows about, and we can trust him in 
for those things, that he is still going to be faithful as he always is. The last thing that Jesus wants us to do is to allow our failures and our sin to get in the way of us approaching him. Because approaching him and coming to him is actually what gives us the power and the strength to please him. That's why he talks about, and we'll see it in the next chapter, in chapter 15, he talks about abiding in him. That if we abide in him and he abides in us, we'll bear much fruit. It's all about fruit. He cares about fruit. He cares about what comes out of our lives. It matters to him. He's, he's measuring the fruit that comes out. It's not just the fruit of the Spirit. And any fruit that's produced by any tree is for the benefit of someone besides the tree. The fruit of the Spirit's meant for God to enjoy, other people to enjoy, that the, our ministry fruit in terms of what God does through us and to bless other people's lives is very important to God. But that only happens as we abide in Him. But when we stumble and when we fail, it's very important. Listen to this and remember it right in your Bible. It's really important. When we stumble and fall, we need to fall towards Him and not fall away from Him. That, you know, sometimes people say, I don't want to come to church when I'm struggling. I don't want to be a hypocrite. It's a hypocrite. It, it's hypocritical if you act like you have it all together and you have no issues and you don't ask for prayer and you don't humble yourself and be honest with your true condition. The word hypocrite means wearing a mask. That's what the actors back in ancient Greece did. They, they would wear masks in their dramas and they would be called hypocrites because they would wear a mask. But if you're honest and you come in here and you say, look, I'm really struggling, that's not being a hypocrite. I need prayer. But that requires a grace-based environment. It requires a place where people are gracious and, and, and are encouraging and will pray for us and, and all of that. So don't ever be harsh with people. Always be encouraging. Always be gracious when they're confessing that they're struggling and offer prayer. This is a hospital. This is an emergency room. People that go in emergency rooms don't pretend that they're not having an issue. And it's normal to see other people in the emergency room not having a good situation in their lives. So we have to be honest with how we are and what the situation that we're in. So Jesus, he knows that Peter's going to deny him three times. Why does he allow that? I mean, we have free, free will, of course. But I think that God would use this. The disciples are here, heard this. They, they heard Jesus say that, that Peter would, and he was a leader. He was a leader among the disciples. And he's saying, you're going to deny me three times. They were watching, listening, and they knew when, once it happened that it happened. And I believe part of it could be he wanted Peter and the other disciples and all Christians in the future to see that he is gracious and is big enough to handle our failures, that he can help us through our failures, in the midst of our failures, as we're going through our failures. He's intimately involved in our lives and wants us to help us in every time of need. That's why the writer of the book of Hebrews wrote this in Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to find help in time of need. When has any subject of a king ever come boldly before that king to the throne to obtain mercy and grace when they've sinned against the king? When have we ever seen that in any civilization at any time? Ever. Never happened but he does it with us. Come boldly. That's the last thing we want to do when we're struggling. We have, we have a time of need. We don't want to come boldly. We want to come sheepishly. We're careful. <coughs> Excuse me. But God wants us to do it. Our high, faithful high priest, in the previous verse in Hebrews 4 says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So he knows all about our weaknesses and failures, even the ones that we haven't lived out yet. And he still loves us, and he still calls us to himself. Because the solution is going to him. See, that holiness that we know that we should be walking in only happens as we draw close to him. And we want to take shortcuts with our maturity, with our holiness. We want to take shortcuts and just try to do it on our own, just try harder and that's where we're going to fail. The, the, success to, the, the key to success of the Christian life is not trying harder to please God. It's spending time with Jesus. And when we spend time with Jesus, all of a sudden his power starts coming through our lives and he starts giving us 
the grace and the power to be able to say no to ungodliness. And that's the key. It's not trying harder, it's drawing close to Jesus. If we put all our focus on drawing close to Jesus, all of a sudden we realize that he gives us the strength and the power to live obediently to him. It's the key to everything. My second point is, it's our responsibility to stop our hearts from being troubled and to have faith in Jesus. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. It's literally, you all must stop letting your heart be troubled. And your there is in plural, is the plural, speaking to all of them. It's like y'all, you know. But the heart, the word heart there in the verse is singular. So each one is responsible for their own heart. But he says, I'm speaking to all of you. I'm speaking to all of you to guard your own heart. And then the tense says it's communicating that their hearts are already troubled. There's no chapter break since that didn't happen until the 13th century. This is just one flowing conversation. You know, it's, it's not like he said, hold on, let's just pause here. There's a chapter coming, chapter break. Okay, chapter 14, verse 1. Now I want to talk to you about something entirely different because we changed the chapter. It didn't happen. It's just one flowing conversation. Sometimes we think our hearts are out of control and we have no control or power over them. If that were true, he wouldn't be telling us here to not let our hearts be troubled. Because it's not just true for the disciples, it's true for us. We're disciples. So it means it's possible. I mean, we can't control our reaction to things, of course. We know that. But what we do, much like our thoughts, our emotions are under our purview by the grace of God, by his power to yield to him in the moment. And, and if we walk in the spirit, we will not gratify the lust of the flesh. Not if we try hard to not gratify the lust of the flesh, then we'll walk in the Spirit. It's the opposite. We have to walk in the Spirit, which means draw close to Jesus, and we will not gratify the lust of the flesh. Those things will, even though we still have a flesh and a sinful nature, those things will just fall off us, in a sense. So it's our responsibility. Now, if you're in a crisis right now, and I'm telling you it's your responsibility for your heart, that can be a little bit discouraging. But we've already talked about that Jesus is so compassionate and gracious. He's already been through anything that we've ever gone through, and he gives us everything that we need to obey him. So this, this, and this whole thing about guarding your heart, it's not a new teaching for them. Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with what? All diligence. We have to be diligent to guard our hearts, to not allow just anything to affect our hearts and to be able to have whatever comes my way be filtered through God's word, through, the, through that wisdom and that sovereignty, and then I can decide whether or not those things are going to be acted upon or not. But the main way to stop allowing our hearts to be troubled is to obey the next part of the verse where he says, um, you believe in God, believe also in me. Because you already trust God, now trust in me. He demands the same trust that, he de- that, that, that God says, he, the Father says, that we should trust him. It's the same thing. By trusting God, we're trusting Jesus. By trusting Jesus, we're trusting God. It's the same thing. Again, trust is the answer. It's always the right answer. No matter what we're going through, faith in Jesus is always the solution. Prayer. Prayer changes things. It bothers me, and I've said it many times, unfortunately, but it bothers me when I hear God's people say, well, all that's left to do is pray. It's our biggest weapon. We should start with prayer and do everything else after because prayer is so incredibly power. What kind of track record does God have with us? How faithful has God been to each one of us? especially us not deserving it. He's been so faithful to it. Such a great track record. So the cure for a troubled heart is to trust in Jesus. But we don't always. We find ourselves in situations where we're not trusting Jesus. And it takes the Holy Spirit to come and, like you do a little kid, you come and take their face and you make them look right at you as you're saying something to them and say, listen to me. Trust in Jesus. The Holy Spirit will always do that. 
God is always working in our lives to get us to trust him in greater and greater ways. We find ourselves in new situations, but he has a track record with us. So yeah, I've never been in this particular situation, but I've been in other ones where he's faithful, and if he can be faithful there, he can be faithful now with this. That's why he had them make the, those, those stones, those remembrance stones, to never forget that he was faithful at certain points in their history so they can trust him for the future. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of spiritual great things that are happening in Israel today among the Jews. Some of them are receiving Jesus as their Messiah. There's revival from the people that do know Jesus. God is stirring that whole area. There's going to be a hundred, in tribulation, there's going to be 144,000 male virgin Jews that are raised up to evangelize the entire world. I believe those those, those Jews are alive today, and God's going to send them out. What helps us when we're struggling as we think about having a troubled heart, the solution is to put our faith in Jesus. But what also can help us is looking what Jesus went through for us. When you question God's ways, look at the cross. And I'm talking to me too. When you struggle with God's decisions, look at the cross. Because we, we go through hardship and difficulty, which Jesus warned us and said, in this life you will face tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So he told us, he was straight up, that we live in a fallen world, there's going to be tribulation, there's going to be spiritual warfare. But he says, I have overcome the the world. But God didn't spare his own son from the wickedness of this world. He allowed his son to go through everything that he went through for us. So yeah, we may hate all the evil in this world, but God says, I didn't help you by not going through the wickedness that man could bring regarding the cross. The cross solves everything in terms of never doubting God's love and commitment and, and, and what he's planned for us. The cross solves everything. It solves everything as we think back. We can always reference it. My third point, my final point is, we can rejoice that Jesus has prepared a place for us. We see that in verses 2 and 3. Let's look there. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also." What Jesus is doing here with his disciples, he's showing them there's a purpose behind him going away. He's going to actually continue this as we get in between chapters 14, uh, and through 14 15, and 16. He say, and he'll say it another way, another purpose of him going away. He goes, it's to your, to vanity, to your advantage that I'm going away. For if I don't go away, I won't send the Holy Spirit to you. And the Holy Spirit is so valuable to the believer and the success of a believer, the Holy Spirit. It's, he's beautiful. And, and, and it, it, it gives us the capacity, he does, to be able to live the Christian life. Because he said, I'm going to give you another counselor. The word another there means another of the same kind. Just like I've been. He's going to be come alongside you to help you. And now I won't be limited by location. Because by my spirit, I can go wherever you go, wherever the church goes. And I, and I will be there for you and do the things that I did for you uh, in person. And in verse 2, notice the word are there. In my Father's house are, present tense, many mansions. In existence at that very moment, in my Father's house, currently there are many mansions. But the places that he talks about, prepare a place for you, those are unprepared at this point for the disciples. So he's going to go prepare a place. And that word's usually translated house there. So he's going to go pre- prepare a place for them to dwell. And he's talking, I believe, more than a house, but more of a home. I don't know what it is about you women that have this gift, but you can turn a house into a home. Men, not so much. I remember when uh, Sandy came, visited my bachelor pad for the first time. It was scary. Scary. You know, again, I'm in my early 20s. I'm I'm just a new Christian, so don't be too harsh, but my dishes would get so bad I have to throw them out. Buy them from yard sales and anything, but but actually wash it, uh, wash wash the the cup. 
uh, in the dishes and all that. So she had to see that, unfortunately. Um, but she was gracious. But after we were married, I never even realized the power of how she could just come in and make a, our place a home. How much more will Jesus make our place a home for us? Because homes are personalized. There's things that are in that home that are unique to our preferences and our tastes and all of those things. The qualities there that we appreciate and our preferences, uniquely a blessing to us. But he made us, didn't he? He made us a certain way. He knows what we like. He knows our preferences. He made us that way. And it's just another way for him to show love towards us. That same heart that's going to, subsequent to his resurrection, could be cooking breakfast for the disciples as they're going and fishing, potentially, you know, avoiding ministry or putting, you know, those things aside temporarily. We don't know why they went fishing, but Peter says, I'm going fishing, and they all joined him. You know, he, they come back, and, and, and he's cooking breakfast for them. That's the same kind of heart that's going to be making a home for us. He thinks of everything, and he does all things well. I'm wondering what our places will be, what, what, what they'll be like. I'm wondering what decisions he'll make on our behalf with them that we'll know exactly why he did that because of what we, how we are, how, what we like and all of that. And, it, and it'll be blessing to see one another's dwelling places. You know, I can go over to Shar's house and I can see what, what Jesus did with the place uh, for her on her behalf and, and be able to appreciate that. Oh, he did this for you because you're this way. I totally get it. That's great. That's wonderful, Shar. It's always picked up. It's nice. It's, uh, it's great. She's like, well, why isn't yours picked up? I don't know. I'm working on that. I have a new body, but I still haven't you know, got that part down yet. But that'll be great to be able to see that. And then verse 3 also says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. Here's the rapture. Oh, I only thought the rapture was in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians 15. No, it's here. Jesus talked about it. This isn't the second coming. The second coming, he physically comes down to earth, touches down on the Mount of Olives. I don't know where we'll be because we'll be following on horses, we're told. We all can't land on the Mount of Olives. It's not that big. Maybe we'll land in the Valley of Megiddo. I have no idea nearby. But he touches down, he comes to earth. The rapture, we go to him in the clouds. That's why he says, I'll receive you to myself where he's going to be, that where I am, you will also be. People say, oh, the rapture is not, you know, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Well, because you don't have a Latin Bible. Get a Latin Bible and the rapture will be in the Bible. You know, the word Bible isn't in the Bible. <laughs> you know, so it's, people do these weird things. But it's, it's you know, what I want to point out to you that's really important here is the word receive there. I will come again and receive you to myself. That word almost always is translated take. It's funny, you know, when you're we're a new pastor in Calvary Chapel, they tell you, don't ever say we take offerings, you receive offerings. I'm like, hmm, that's good. That's a good a mental note. But the word really, like if you look up 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and you look at when it says that the Lord himself will descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together in the clouds, and thus we will ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. That word caught up is the word from which we get our word rapture. So it's the word hapazo in Greek. It means to violently snatch. Remember that game where you, you know that game where someone puts out their hand, you try to slap their hands, or they have something in their hand, and you try to grab it out. I mean, it's, that's a really weak picture of what's going to happen because in Romans 8, 11, it says, if the spirit dwells in you, he will likewise raise your bodies to life. The Holy Spirit in us is going to be the catalyst to change, transform our lives in the twinkling of an eye, which is the speed at which light reflects off our eye. That's how fast our bodies are going to be transformed and we're going to be snatched away and instantly get our new bodies. We're going to be talking, let's say we're awake. It's not time when we're sleeping. I believe it's when we're going to be awake because I believe that trumpet call, we're going to hear it spiritually. So we're going to know nanoseconds before it happens that it's going to happen. We're going to hear this come up here, whatever it is, and we're going to go, and we're gone. We're going to have a new, new body. And then everyone on the way up that's not pre-trib is going to be thankful 
you know, that, that it really was pre-trib, that really, the rapture really does happen at the beginning of the seven-year tribulation. But I digress. Snatching. We're going to be received to myself. He's going to grab us and take us up. And we're going to be with him. And that's why we're supposed to comfort one another. If the, if the rapture were in the middle of the seven-year tribulation or at the end, there is no comforting in the rapture. Because the Antichrist is coming before that then, in that case, and there's going to be persecution, and we'd be looking for the Antichrist. But God says we're supposed to look to Jesus. We're supposed to be looking for Jesus, not looking for the Antichrist. So he's saying, I'm going away, but I'm going away for a purpose. I'm going away because I'm going to prepare a place that's perfect for you. I'm also going away so I can send the Holy Spirit to you so that you can receive this other counselor that's just like me, Everywhere you go and you won't need me to be there in your physical presence. And I bet you that just blew their minds like, you mean it, what do you mean advantage? It's your advantage that you go away? I would be content with it being just as good as when you're here. But you're saying it's even better that you're not going to be here. And they just couldn't, couldn't even comprehend that. So lots to comfort and encourage us, us with today. Don't let your heart be troubled. Trust only in Jesus. Resort, rejoice that Jesus is preparing the perfect home for us and, and that we'll, we'll be with him where he is. He's not coming here before we see him because when's the wedding supper of the Lamb's going to happen? It's going to happen during the seven-year tribulation most likely when, and, and the judgment seat of Christ. So all that's done, all that's wrapped up, we're finished with that. Then at the end of the seven years, after only 25% of the earth's population remains alive, the end of the seven years, He's going to come back physically, and we're going to be following him. As I close, I just want to encourage us regarding being ready to enter this new year that we start tomorrow. We start a new year tomorrow, and I know, hopefully you know that. I heard there's some guy that lights off a cannon in El Granada. Uh, anyone heard that before? No? Louis says there is. He's the only one raising his hand, so maybe he's the only one. You've heard, you, you've heard that before? What's wrong with these people? Lighting off cannons? I don't need that at midnight. You know, boom. You know, yeah. Anyway, yeah, that's not going to be fun. But, you know, this is the typical time that we take stock. We think about how 2023 has been, um, how 2024 may be. It's good. It's healthy. I mean, you know every gym is going to be filled in January. You know, people make all these decisions, and then all of a sudden they kind of wane on those things. But this is... This is um, critical for our stewardship in terms of what God's entrusted to us. How, how, how had, how's 2023 gone? Not necessarily regarding you know, New Year's resolutions or anything like that, but I think it's good, it's healthy for us to look at those things and, and look and see, like, is this something that, where can I grow? What areas can I grow? I would recommend going for a walk and just writing those things down, or just getting a time alone. How, how did I do, Lord, this year? How did I do? How faithful was I? What are some areas that I can, I can grow in? What are your spiritual goal, goals for 2024? Spiritual goals? That's weird. I've never put those two words together. Well, we're always needing to grow, and, and we can't know that ahead of time. The Lord has to reveal these things, but you know, what are the things we need to grow in? Do we want to learn a, really learn a book of the Bible, or a, a, a really you know, powerful doctrine or theological position that we really want to look into, or do we, do we want to be more available for the Lord to use? God will bless all those things as we think about them, as we pray about them. But there's one thing that I've, I want to encourage you with regarding these things is focus on small changes that are more permanent, because that's actually what happens. We make bigger changes, they usually end up being temporal. But small changes end up usually being more permanent because we can only handle so much change at once. So take that wisdom and, and take that to prayer and see what the Lord might say to you regarding 2024, something that he lays on your heart, something that he wants you to do. If there's an area of service you have interest in, please see me or Pastor Mike. It doesn't, just because we don't have something doesn't mean that we're not praying for it to come here in terms of a ministry or We'd like to know those things. 2024 is going to be a great year. We're going to be able to do lots of uh, evangelism, lots of outreach. We're getting our house in order, ready for people, visitors to come in. All those things are almost done. And then we're going to be 
uh, praying about different outreaches and things. We're going to need your input. We're going to need your what you think about things. This is not just about leaders praying about things. This is all of us hearing from the Holy Spirit regarding what he wants for our church. This is his church. This is not our church. This is ultimately his church. He gets to do it as he pleases. He's the head of the church. We need to seek him and pray and ask what he wants us to be doing. And, and it's always great. It's always great, whatever he wants, has us doing. You know, we're getting closer and closer, I believe, to the rapture of the church coming. He's, there's so many people. You know, you realize how many people are coming to Christ? Generation Z is coming to Christ like crazy. We have people all over the world getting saved. We have Muslims that are, Jesus appearing to them in their dreams. 200 people at once overnight had a dream about Jesus and all this is in Gaza and received Christ, received Jesus as the Messiah. They don't have anything in this world. No one's there for them. And Christians are being there for them. And it's making a difference. There's, there's all kinds of things that are happening that we're unaware of. We have to be sensitive. And he's given us all of us at least one spiritual gift. And he calls all of us to use that spirit, those spiritual gifts when we engage the body of Christ. I firmly believe we're going to grow in the gifts of the Spirit in 2024. I believe that we're going to grow together in prayer. We're going to grow together in sharing our faith. We're going to hear people share their testimony that got saved through one of our outreaches or the radio or whatever it is. There's every platform we're, we're open to God using through the church here regarding the gospel and ministry. But it all requires us doing our part, being sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading you know, one of the things I learned early on, not that I've always been able to uh, have this happen, but I learned early on, have everybody seek the Lord regarding what God would have them do. And if the parts are supernaturally led by the Holy Spirit and supernatural, then the whole will be supernatural and led by the Holy Spirit. And that's the key. We don't just say, we need this position filled because so-and-so had all these gifts. We go, oh, okay, now there's an opening, but maybe this person that comes in is going to do part of that And then they have a whole other ministry we don't have yet that maybe we've been praying for, maybe we haven't been praying for. And we let the Holy, who the Holy Spirit's calling shape the ministry instead of our ideas of what the church should be about. That's how you have a Holy Spirit led and directed church from what I see from scripture. So we're in a good spot and I'm excited about what the Lord has and I'm excited about doing it with you. Let's pray together. Thank you, Jesus, for your instruction. I pray for every single person that hears my voice. If their hearts are troubled, Lord, would you strengthen their hearts? Would you give them your perspective? Would you minister to them? Would you show them that you care about their, what they're going through and that you have compassion for them? Help them to put their faith in you and trust you. And Father, I pray that you'd help us all to be sensitive to people around us and what they're going through and help us to have your heart and your compassion for people You love us so much. We're so grateful that you've thought of everything. We thank you that you are preparing a place for us. We thank you that you do know us intimately. We thank you that where you are, we will be, Lord. We we say, Maranatha, we say, come quickly, Lord. But we also know that there's many people that are still yet unbelievers, still yet to, to trust you for salvation. And we want to be used by you to help them come into your light and to be transformed by your Holy Spirit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.